Hi, how are you? Looks like you're muted. Hello. Hi. Hi, Julian. Um, it looks as though my camera is not working. Oh dear. Uh, I wonder if I can just quickly reboot my computer. Uh, uh, that will make it work again. It seems to be if I move between apps and I haven't figured out how to stop it from <laughs> this age. So sure. can, do you if I just join in, in five minutes? I'm going to reboot and, and then it will, because it's horrible to have a conversation without looking at the <laughs> Well, um, you know, if it's Zoom, we might as well see each other, right? So yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, okay, so I'll I'll just reboot and rejoin. Okay, great. Okay, see you now. Yep, thank you. Goose. And yeah. Okay, so yeah, so that's my that's my side of it. And and like it was very eye opening because I thought, well, like I said in the in what I wrote to you, I don't know if you know, maybe this could be one single story book length story one story about maybe one person right mm -hmm. or maybe what i want to do is a a series of chapters about these mm -hmm. these battles in different areas mm -hmm. kind of chosen for the reason for for what i'm saying for their narrative power and emotional mm -hmm. resonance right i mean the, the other way to look at it which i think i said in my email to you is i'm I, I've thought a lot, I've, you know, I've had a lot of time to think about this because I've been working on other stuff, waiting to get tenure and the chance to get a sabbatical. And I've thought, um, you know, there's a genre of, I think, I don't know what the word would be, but like environmental anthem or man, I don't want to call it manifesto, but like books that are, you know, that are iconic for the environmental I don't even want to say movement, but for the environmental mm -hmm. spirit mm -hmm. and like, like Silent Spring, you know, or the Sand County Almanac. I mean, there's a few of them and I'm, and to be honest, I've been working on my media history. It's I'm, I'm, I'm finally turning to tackle this, but what I found mm -hmm. with all the books that I've read that when you read them for the forties, fifties, early seventies, like the monkey wrench gang is they're definitely not written in 2022. Like the, yeah. the, the, the feeling that, that those of us that care have isn't, isn't ex articulated in any of these books. And mm -hmm. so I'm kind of looking at this, like on the one hand, it, it would be in the tradition of like everything going back from Herman Melville to Jack London to John Krakauer, you know, or, or mm -hmm. Stephen Crane, you know, with like open boat, like this adventure in the wild kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the idea of a of a book that speaks to environmentalism or of, of mm -hmm. environmentalism and that the way to find maybe the voice in 2022 for environmentalism is to look as, you know, get a close up look at mass extinction. And th mm -hmm. this is kind of the front line to me, of, you know, especially in the Congo. I mean, that's just because you know however oh goodness just need a wildlife i just killed a bee uh anyway um but uh i, I shouldn't kill animals while i'm talking about saving animals but uh, anyway um 
Yeah, but uh, it just they scare me, you know. So, um, but like anyway, so um, I I guess like yeah, so that that's the concept, and then mm. but but that's that's I don't know that that's what I can write down, you know. For maybe that's too ethereal for. Um, no, I mean, well, you know, so it's so much of that sort of thing depends on who you meet how much access they give you to their lives. And, you know, it sounds to me like you'd need to to spend a lot of time in the parks talking to, to people uh, and, you know, maybe kind of finding, uh, you know, that, so it's sometimes, as you, you know how it is with, with literary journalism, sometimes the source uh, or subject becomes the main topic of the story because they're so <laughs> fascinating and they're so open to interviews and sometimes you plan it that way and then you meet them and they're totally boring uh, and don't and don't give you the material you anticipate you know I mean I know yeah I've had many sort of failed projects like that so it kind of depends on that I guess um I mean I think one crucial thing is like I don't know if you've seen but there's like n fancy Netflix documentaries about all this and what mm -hmm. I found about them is, I mean, Virunga was really the, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Have you ever seen that? No. Um, it's a really heartbreaking and extraordinary film. I mean, it was really seeing that in 2014 that initially inspired this idea. And I, I kind of mm -hmm. don't want to give it away, but it's about the situation we were discussing in the Congo. And um, I mean, I guess all I want to say about it is that the, I don't want to give away what happens if you're going to see it, but but they didn't know what they were filming when they started out. They went into the park with one idea of what, and then, you know, the situation. Right, somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. I'll just say that about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, but it's really powerful film. I mean, it's, I, it's hard for me to watch a lot of environmental films because they're difficult. And this one was hard to watch in a way, but it, it was also really, really worth, watching but um just say what it's called again it's called virunga which is the name virunga. of the, here i'll put it in the chat okay. anyway i guess what i was saying about um these netflix films like there's one called the elephant game or the rhino the ivory game mm -hmm. and i feel like with both of these they went straight into the eye of the storm, like especially the, the ivory game, they like they follow this undercover investigation into the ivory trade. And anyway, the point is, I'm not trying to get myself killed. I, I'm not trying to like camp out in the middle of the Congo in this war over the poachers. And I'm not trying to investigate ivory poachers by going undercover. I'm trying to, you know, because this is a risky, I think, potentially very risky project. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to find out the motivations of the people who uh, who put themselves in danger. Like, they don't have to be victims for me to write about them. You know, they don't have mm -hmm. to have been murdered. But yeah. you know, the people who put, put themselves in danger, the people who were killed, and the animals, which I think are characters in themselves. Like what, what was it? Like the, the main question I'm asking is what was, what's the motivation for, or motivations for these mm -hmm. people to, to do this? And what are, you know, I guess one of the questions would be, what are they really putting on the line? Like what's the level of risk? What are they aware of as the level of risk? And then why? Um, but anyway, I'm doing a lot of talking. I, I, what I can do is I can share my screen for what they asked because I what I did was I wrote down the questions I can't really answer without help from you folks over there in case you have some insight into them and then we can mm -hmm. walk through them or you, you can just brainstorm some ideas so um so uh, this is the first thing they want to know what do I plan to do and how I plan to do it I told you about this this is the mission of um mm -hmm. Fulbright so if I drag my cursor, by the way, does it kind of highlight? What yeah, I'm... yeah, it does. So, um, yeah, which is, you know, I think clear enough. I mean, I like they seem to be interested in what we're all able to do when we get together more than what I actually get accomplished. I don't know. It's it's odd that way. 
You know, they say that they say we're unusual in that. Wow. Um, and so I think the idea that in addition to say maybe uh, wits or how did you say it? bits in addition to bits? Uh, yeah, bits, bits. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to bits, um, that like that being able to visit with you all, even if I did the official partnership there because it's closer to the parks would help yeah. make the case but then here's so here's the question that i that i finally you know put down is um that that you could help me with is yeah, okay. what benefits will the project produce for your host your discipline well let's just say your host mm -hmm. and leave it at that right um and then the other thing that i was thinking you could help me is is why this location so some of these I could even eliminate. Well, I'll, let me leave that because mm -hmm. maybe you have some ideas about how what kind of a partnership I should get. But um, mm -hmm. these two questions, what's the emphasis for the project? You know, it's funny because I'm coming up with strange ideas <laughs> for some of this that I don't know that I want to say. Like when you mm -hmm. said speaking of wildlife, when the dog barked, it's like, uh, I'll, you know, I, as an adult, you don't have like animals when you're a kid you have your parents animals but you don't have your own animals so it's it's only been in my adulthood that i discovered what animals mean to me and what they are as individuals like how i understand them as individuals and i just i don't think i make the distinctions that normal people do between animals and people like they mm -hmm. seem to me to be very very full personalities you know, mm -hmm. and, and so it's, a, there's a, there's an animal as ambassador thing going on with this whole project for me of like the, my cats are important to me to the, as an impetus for the project. I just mm -hmm. don't know if I want to explain that to Fulbright, but. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, the, the zoo and the, and the, the role that, these animals play in popular culture is the other part of that mm. you know mm. um i think you 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 you're going to be quite surprised by um some of the stuff you might find in south africa when it comes to inequality and um and and the role of of animals uh just to to give you some the, the sort of racial it's quite a racial issue here um in that pets and are seen to be you know something that is a, a kind of white phenomenon um not necessarily part of uh what we called the black community so there every now and then something happens that uh, uh in, in sort of public that this you know it will be something along the lines of like oh well, white people treat animals better than they treat black citizens in south africa it will be an accusation that is sometimes comes up um so i mean it's a very rich environment in terms of for, for, for any kind of narrative exploratory project. Um, I, I'm fairly confident that you're going to find that what the impetus is for many of the persons working in parks at the front line, not all of them, but many of them, it's going to be economic. Um, it's not necessarily going to be around, um, it, it, it's not necessarily going to be because of a desire to, or, or out of any kind of love or concern for, for animals, it's going to be that this is a job uh, in a place where it's very difficult to, to find work. Uh, I don't think that would be true for everyone, but I think it'd be true for, for many. Um, it depends on who you work, you, you know, who you, who you talk to. So, I mean, there've been lots of little funny incidents where I think there was somebody at the University of Cape Town who actually did a study, um, which was 
very poorly received um, and she was accused of racism uh, where she tried to understand why environmental issues and exactly what you're talking about, um, why her class uptake, uh, uh, I can't remember what the course was, but why so few African students took the, the course. And she asked questions around whether you had pets in childhood uh, and it was seen to be very discriminatory and racist. And she was, you know, um, admonished for having conducted the study. Um, but those are the kinds of issues that crop up in the environment of, of South Africa, which is inseparable from its apartheid past. Uh, so that, you know, it's a very dense, meshed environment. Um, yes. I don't know. Yeah. So wait, let me let me narrow this down a little bit and clean it up a little so we can just focus on mm. um, kind of what what questions you can answer that I can't answer mm. very well. Um, so I think like I'm gonna put a pin in this one because why this award that's that do I do research or do I do teaching or do I do both? Mm -hmm um let me uh put that down here um uh, but and then this one why this location is kind of the same as this question um okay so um okay so like, can I throw these at you and we can d give it your best shot? What, oh. do you, what do you think might be my best explanation for Fulbright on uh, what benefits will the project produce for the host? And I, I, you know, I guess we can talk separately about if I'm pursuing the research project that I suggested and if I'm giving guest talks or, or teaching a course or courses. Mm. Yeah. Um, so does this mean the host institution or the host country? Um, I think I can deal with those respectively. Okay. I mean, so for the host country and, and exploration of the, the setup, um, if that's not something that's been done before, uh, is likely to um shed light on uh a complex the sort of complex economic setup that leads to uh, yeah complex economic setup um it's probably going to i would say provide some kind of um, positive feedback or, you know, but how... You know, uh, I was thinking, <laughs> going back to what you said a moment ago and now hearing mm. what you're saying now, mm. I'm wondering if this is a conversation you feel isn't happening enough in like South Africa, that South Africa. yeah, there. that's basically what I'm saying. It's like I don't think anyone is looking into why are you know uh, the the people who work in wildlife parks. I think it often takes a foreigner to come in and to sort of see those things because we just accept them readily. Um, you know, a foreigner will come in and and notice things about the South African way of life that a, a South African won't notice him or herself uh, because That's... it's so different to the way things work back home. I mean, I always believe that, you know, when I teach narrative literary journalism and we often have foreign students and they say, oh, we're at such a disadvantage because we don't have networks here. And I always say, no, you're not, because you're going to look at this environment so differently to the rest of the class. You're going to see things. <laughs> So with such fresh eyes um, that uh, things that we accept as normal, um, you you will realize aren't normal and will remind South Africans of that. 
So I think, you know, there's you might come in with an assumption that people working in wildlife parks are doing so because they love animals, but there'll be a host of different reasons um, for, for, for their taking up those um, positions. Um, and the more people remind uh, South Africa of that, the, the better, I think. I mean, I think something else to to look at would be the the families, maybe to interview families of people who've lost um, breadwinners, yes. who worked in wildlife parks, that kind of thing um, might might shed light. You know, and um, as as someone with a journalism experience, part of this whole COVID thing I was telling you is my instinct was to be trying to talk to those families and those colleagues and that whole thing, like starting to report the story so that I could write a clear mm. proposal. And that's where mm. I just thought, I, I can't go there right now. Not in South Africa, not with these people who've lost loved ones. I can't get on the, mm. I get on the email with them or phone, yeah, I, yeah. not with this deadline. And yeah. yeah. I don't I don't think you can do that now, but maybe when you're here, yeah. you know, that could be part of your your plan. I mean, it's not the sort of thing to it's also it's very difficult in South Africa to trace people. Um, it's not as easy as it is in 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 first world countries. People change their phone numbers all the time. You actually have to be in situ in order to to access those kinds of um on the ground field working you know right. people it's 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 difficult uh to i mean i've tried to do this kind of research myself and it's it's people don't have permanent addresses they they move a lot uh you know and it's it's it has to work through that sort of snowball sampling method of like finding a person and then finding a person and finding a person and finding a person um it's not you know a case of looking up somebody's name names are variously spelt so they're often incorrectly you know written in newspapers so you might sort of think oh okay well there's the you know the person who who died trying to protect rhinos uh let me look up his wife and uh, if, you know looking up his wife is a whole mission yeah <laughs> like is, is leroy brewer spelled b-r-w i'm um, b-r-u-w-e-r yeah. or is it spelled i mean yeah, yeah. With, also with African names, it's it's difficult. Um, yeah, these are all really great points you're making that are really helping me because you know, like I, I they the a big part of what they say, which I've cut out of here, is and how has your previous experience prepared you to do any of this? And you know, I was hired. I'm grew up in Boston, and I was hired in South Louisiana by the paper when they hired me the editor and the publisher said we're hiring well actually is the editor and senior editor said we're hiring you because you're a yankee you're a complete outsider and you're going to see things here differently and the first thing that happened when i got down there before i'd even started the job was i went with the reporter i was replacing who was also yankee um to a cockfight and i thought it would be I thought it would be um, fascinating and a cultural experience and, uh, you know, exotic or something. You know, I had no idea. I, I, I had just started on, and it was these experiences that, that, you know, started me having animals and, and have the experience. But I went to the cockfight and I just couldn't stay. It was the most horrific thing I'd ever seen. And then the, the, then I started the job and they laughed and they said, let's give the Yankee the Klan rally. The Ku Klux Klan, for the first time in many years, was having a demonstration uh, in the middle of the town. And there was a federal court dispute over whether they could hold the rally. But the my bosses thought it was hilarious to give me as my first story there the Ku Klux Klan story. Um, and it kind of, it, it evolved from there. I mean, I, I, that first year I ended up living in Louisiana for 15 years or the better part of 15 years, but the first year or so was like one culture shock after another. And it was, again, I was writing for the paper because I had that outside perspective yeah. which in, in some ways I never really lost, you know, yeah, um, yeah. but you know, so that, that makes a lot of sense. It's, and it's also the flip side because it, 
it answers both what might be the benefits to the home country is that it would instigate a conversation that needs to happen. And maybe mm -hmm. it takes an outsider to do that. And also mm -hmm. the, the other question here is what challenges do you expect to face? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, so it's like the fact that like you come up with an idea like this in the first place with all these preconceptions in your head. And then mm -hmm. I keep, I tell this to my journalism students all the time. It's like, you know, you can't just sit there and theorize about story ideas, not as a journalist, because mm -hmm. the moment you have your first conversation with with somebody, that's all going to melt like snow in the sun, you know. Um, so mm -hmm. so that's what. But what about if we're talking about does this answer change for benefits and or challenges if we talk about me going farther north like Kenya or Tanzania? Sorry, say that again. Like when, so if the question is what benefits will this produce for the host country and that kind mm -hmm. of led us into what challenges produce, like mm -hmm. we're tied together. What if, what like would everything you just said apply equally if we're talking about Kenya or Tanzania or what do you think? It would, it, I think it would be exacerbated. <laughs> so it would definitely be easier to research this in South Africa just because Oh, you're going to have um, better equipped and better um, better established universities, contacts, um, people who understand what you're trying to do. Um, as, whereas I think, well, the Congo would be, you know, I don't think I would even go into the Congo trying to to research things there. Uh, but yeah, you'll, you'll have a better, the, the, the parks here as well. Um, you know, you'll probably find people you can interview there, um, in in Tanzania and and the Kenya, but uh, uh, in Kenya. But I think South Africa. I think your instinct that this is a launch pad for the research, um, is is correct because. You, I mean, I can think of various people I can put you in touch with. Um, you know, already um, in terms of the, the research and contacts and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if you would find someone in Kenya who would be able to think of those networks to put you in touch with. So the problem of locating people will be exacerbated in, in those countries. Um, so that's why I think South Africa would be a good, a good launch pad. It's got a better focus on environmentalism to begin with um all of those all of those things you know um uh, yeah. so that's that's you know you don't want to do something because it's easy but you also don't want to make it impossible for yourself yeah this is really helping me thank you so much martha yeah. you know finally honestly i've been freaking out about this because it's so you know i'm just here in hawaii <laughs> speculating about it and yeah and a lot of your answers obviously are things that maybe i could have figured out so with, yeah yeah, with instincts, yeah. But it's, but yeah no not really not you've really put mm -hmm. you know nailed it um mm -hmm. but um you, can i ask you to you know what i could do with the sources at this stage i think is because then the next question we have here is um um where is it research they want like a step-by-step -step research plan right yeah Which we'll talk about in a moment but definitely what would help with that is if if you okay. provided me the names of sources and I, I really I wouldn't get started on the reporting on this until mm. I, I've got a clearer idea of because if I can't get the Fulbright for next year I may need to wait another year right mm -hmm. um and there's a lot of like you could see there's a lot of balls up in the air right now but if you could yeah. provide could you provide me like the list of sources would you mind yeah i mean these are just people i think you could speak to who might be able to put you in touch with other people so there's a friend of mine who's a, who's a travel journalist justin fox um so he you know he would be somebody who would be good to speak to because he would be able to tell you who to speak to <laughs> uh, yeah. but you you know he has quite he's traveled to all of the parks he knows everyone he's right. you know in the, in the western cape he's done stuff tracking leopard and um that kind of thing 
And then the other one, there was actually a launch of a book the other day. I'll forward it to you. Um, and it was, I, rem I remember thinking it was after you'd written to me and I was thinking, oh, it's a pity you're not here to go to that launch because it would have been, you know, um, relevant uh, to, to your research in some way. I, um, wonder, I don't have the name at hand. Yeah, I wonder if I should try to chase your friend down right now it you know the 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 propose i've got to write the proposal i think this weekend which mm -hmm. i'm speaking to and that you know friday morning mm -hmm. and i mean sometimes less is more honestly with a proposal mm -hmm. like this yeah uh, if yeah. i start really researching the story itself uh, th that could get like yeah. I get too too tight with everything um mm -hmm. i mean they're not going to totally know that you know there's all these no things exactly yeah uh, uh, you just, don't expect that. I mean, at this point, it's a bit like writing an abstract for <laughs> for a, a conference. You know, you write it and then, and then right. the conference comes and you start doing the actual research. And it obviously sometimes takes a different direction. But yeah, it's, I mean, uh, I think here you'd need to think with the research plan, you'd need to think very carefully about how much time you wanted to spend in each place. Um uh, so if you have somebody at the University of Cape, of Cape Town whose research you want to engage with, I mean, there are things that you can do here in Cape Town as well. There are, uh, I wouldn't call them wildlife defenders, so, uh, you know, the, the leopard is very endangered and leopards, um, there, there are places here that you could go to, there are leopards you know, trusts and things. Um, so there are places here in in the cape as well but mainly you probably want to be up north um and then there's a whole host of other stuff that happens um dog fighting and you're just thinking of that with a there's a huge animal rescue um sort of we have a lot a big problem with sterilization and and township dogs and that i don't know if that's anything that would well, be what, what if you know I'm a historian, so what if I did like one one of the things I talked about with Greenpeace was to do like there have been books about Greenpeace, of course, and Sea Shepherds, but I talked mm -hmm. about in working with them, two places I would go for sure on that would be one to Vancouver where their movement started, you know, where Greenpeace started because mm -hmm. of some of the people who still live there, and two to DC because of their archives. So as mm -hmm. a historian, I'm used to going where the archives are mm -hmm. and you know is there a are there any historical stories about you know because also i'm thinking if part of it is i'm trying to find really strong narratives some of those may have happened in the 80s and the 70s you know there may be some story that can be told that's not because leroy Brewer was killed in 2017, right? It, 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 you know, like Diane Fossey would be, mm. you know, the ultimate example of that. But, mm. you know, um, yeah. So, um, can't think of any offhand. Um, uh, there's not going to be a lot of historical, you know, there's not going to be an archive or anything like that. But, uh, oh, I actually had a student who did a narrative literary journalism piece about she basically spent time with an SBCA inspector who went into who goes into townships to look after look into animal welfare. Um, she actually wrote a, a piece about this and you know just a, sh a small little story like that was huge it was hugely revealing of it because there's so many other issues that come into play you know yeah, the, I, I got traumatized by you know which this book yeah, traumatized traumatized me, but yeah. I you know I thought oh I'll do a story this is a little bit like, like my naive experience of doing mm. the um, cockfighting, yeah. cockfighting thing was I I'd said oh I'll do a story about the dog catcher because I was doing profiles of local figures every week this is before mm. the year before um, and actually what happened was I, I, you know, I ended up with like practically PTSD after spending a day with animal control and I woke mm -hmm. up in the morning and I opened my door and this little male cat wasn't quite an adult yet flopped over and showed me his belly and 
waved around. And I, I, having been through what I went through with the strays all day, it was kind of a weird coincidence. And I immediately grabbed him and I put him inside and Buster was my first animal. And th mm. that was when my relationships with animals began. Mm. So it's mm. funny that you bring up the animal control thing, but yeah, mm. that's, mm. it's really quite intense as like local stories. It's I mean, I was a crime intense. reporter for yeah. a year. Yeah, uh, that, whole, I mean, that year I was a crime reporter. I covered killings, human to human all year and nothing was affected me the way the animal mm -hmm. story did. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, well, I just wonder if um, maybe it'll occur to you, but if there's like the gorillas in the mist story there, you know, if there's, I mean, for one thing, I don't think the killings of people, the killings of wildlife defenders, I don't think that's a recent phenomenon like that's been happening at least since the the 70s or 80s if not long before that in South Africa and yeah I think there's probably a lot of um you know I just remember when I was in Kenya in a park speaking to one of the the rangers who was kind of showing us the park and everything and being surprised to hear that he was quite an elderly person and being surprised to hear that he had originally been someone who took people hunting and now he was this wildlife, uh, you know, and he'd made that transition quite seamlessly from somebody who helped people track animals in order to kill them, um, who now tracked animals in order to show people. So, I mean, that's the kind of narrative that, uh, you know, is, is I, I can see working, you know, um, as a story of some sort. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and that's true, even this with, lot. Even this with lot. the biologists. <laughs> yes. You know, like they, when you hear them talk about it, they're not, they don't talk about it in maybe the way we would, you know, they talk about, oh, you could bring in tourism if you sold this many elephant trophies per mm. year or whatever, you know, these bizarre, where you're like, mm. no, how could you even talk about that? And that's because yeah. they're, far enough they're intimate enough with this stuff that they've learned to, yeah. to 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 consider it and argue it in very practical terms and they're also i mean i'm reading i started reading to understand this a book called eye of the elephant and it it doesn't take very long into it where you start hearing them talk in terms of these animals could have great use for safari hunting and yeah. stuff as a way to save the animals yeah yeah there's a lot of that talk here as well you know so that would be oh, there's, there's so much I mean, there's no shortage of of stories and um interesting ironies i mean it's like it's a great topic for narrative literary journalism you know um, so i i think the plan would be to start in south africa with the nearby parks and then try to expand and mm. explore the story almost geographically, right? Mm. Because, you know, in lieu of not knowing some major historical ones and just having a handful of victims' names, which which may or may not yield fruit as a story, the, the story mm. may be about the day-to-day the -day or some of the major players who are alive, right? Mm. Uh, mm. You know, the idea that I have to focus on people who've been killed is, you know, I don't think that's mm. a smart uh idea but the idea of proceeding geographically um as i can develop strong sources and support um one step at a time yeah well and i think emphasizing what you said which is that there's no way for me to plan this um any more um specifically than that because so much of it has to happen in situ between yeah. what you're seeing between what's going on there the animals themselves and the mm -hmm. fact that you can't just call people it's not a it's not an antiseptic research project it's mm -hmm. journalism it's got to be yeah. on the ground yeah yeah um Julian I have to go um I have another yeah. meeting but I think we but... answered all the questions didn't we yeah and I can put you in touch with a um a friend of mine I'm not sure where he is at the moment he might have moved to London but Justin Fox who's a travel journalism a travel journalist he knows okay. the parks right so he might be able to tell you details around things like which parks would be good to visit and 
and that kind of thing. So I'll email link you um, and and see if he, he if he can help you okay. with you know those more specific details. So I mean um, I can give you a bit of a rough idea of what South Africa is like, but he he will have more you know names and that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm wondering, you know, if I were to, if if like I things with Vitz and Limpopo are still a bit up in the air, so mm -hmm. and the deadline is like less than, you know, it's like less than two weeks from now. So mm -hmm. if I was to work something out with with you and Lynette, do you think could I draw? Would you go? I mean, we we have until September 30th actually for a letter of invitation, mm -hmm. but. Okay. Do you think it would make more sense to do teaching and research? And like the teaching could be, I could do guest lectures. If I try to, I'd love to teach a class or two with you yes. guys. But if I do that, I think it might be hard even within South Africa to do the traveling for the research, right? Yeah. Um, so is there a way I could do a, so do you think it makes sense for me to do a teaching research thing, but I, I'd be doing guest lectures for the classes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could, uh, the guest lectures would be easy enough to arrange. And we can also do them virtually if you aren't, you know, if it doesn't work with your schedule. So, um, you know, we now do that routinely. Um, we'll have a guest lecture who zooms in if, if yeah. it's, if you, if, if it happens to clash with any of your travels. Um, so that's, that's pretty flexible. Uh, what, what is the teaching? Is there like a component, a minimum component or? No, I don't oh, think so. No, no, you just have to do a bit of teaching. Yeah, there, you know, yeah. would you be a benefit to, to them as an instructor, I think is the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We always, we, it's always great to have, you know, um, guest lecturers and that sort of thing. Yeah, and particularly if, with this project, um, because uh it sounds as though you could talk talk students through the process of the research that you've been doing you know with the environmental course like looking at greenpeace getting this map you know just actually taking them through that research process would be interesting to them i think yeah yeah and I mean, probably probably benefit you as well because sometimes um you know talking about your the research that you're currently doing. I don't know about you, but it always helps me with the actual research. I just want to read what it says for teaching. It says, teaching includes classroom teaching as well as giving guest lectures, workshops, and seminars and engaging in other related activities. Classroom teaching is typically at the undergraduate and graduate level, so it's very vague. The mm, teaching okay. varies by award as well as by host institution. Um, scholars may also consult I, I'll try and look a little more into this, but I, I think, um, you know, it's it's definitely viable. The, the other thing I should mention, I know you have to go, but is I've been doing a lot with digital storytelling. So like yeah, in addition that'd to- That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, so I can, and in fact, I'm, I'm publishing a, a st an article about that, about, mm -hmm. you know, the digitization of historical newspapers and all the mm -hmm. politics, and it, but the the flip side of it is that the tools for creating interactive maps and timelines to tell historical stories or other stories mm -hmm. are getting so easy to use. I that know. The challenge is, <laughs> is is just doing the research to load the content into interactive. I maps. know. I know. Isn't it great? <laughs> yeah. So that so I can do a lot of that too with with students. Yeah. You know, and and do media history with them that. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that all sounds fantastic. We've got a, a, a small class multimedia journalism course at the undergraduate level where we do exactly this sort of thing. Um, you know, so they, uh, uh, that would that would fit in beautifully with that. Yeah, or I mean, I, I teach, I teach that and I also have taught now every year, I'm the only one qualified, I guess, in Hawaii to teach it. So I keep teaching it is multimedia mm -hmm. reporting. You know, so we okay. can do yeah. photojournalism, audio storytelling, graphic yeah. design, and then we converge, yeah. put it, you know, convergence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, We've got exactly that. I mean, I can send you the course outlines of those courses if you want to have a look at them. I don't know if that's the sort of detail you need for the teaching. Well, the aspect. problem is, 
I think that we run into this thing of like, you know, how do I, um, how do I, if I'm going to teach a class, mm. like, how do I, uh, like do that and then travel to do the re research. Mm. So I think mm. it, maybe we just lay it out as a partnership. I'll be guest lecturing. This is something that I can offer UCT mm. and then, um, at the same time, like Annette is really could be the foundation for the research partnership. So mm -hmm. if I could yeah. get, we could draft a letter of invitation and, you know, if you guys can co-sign by the 30th, okay. you know, um, but okay. let me find out what's going on with these other places closer to the parks and follow okay. up. But I, I really appreciate all the help. This is a huge help. And what I'll do is transcribe the things you said about the benefits because there's, okay. there's a lot in there and yeah. if you don't mind maybe even quote you about some of those observations yeah, yeah that's, that's fine yeah, no okay problem. all right um well thank you so much martha and you, uh, i guess i'll just follow up with you as soon as i have the next piece of information what, what what's this let me write down your friend's name uh, uh justin box okay Great name for a travel journalist in yeah. Africa. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you have, maybe send me his contact info. I will. I will. Okay. Yeah. I'll put you in touch by e e email. Okay, great. Well, yeah, you know, you, you folks in South Africa, you really hide your email addresses really well. It's, I don't know why. Every, like in America, in a department, university department website, it's like, boom, the email addresses for everybody is right there. And here yeah. I had to do research to find, like what I would do is I would find something the person published and then maybe if I was lucky, there'd be an email address in the journal article, you know? No, so, not mine, I don't think, mine no. is there. Thank yeah, you, yeah. yeah, you were helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of these people, it's like, why are you, why is it so hard to find your email address? Yeah. I'm not trying to find <laughs> your home address, I just, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so okay well you know and again we like we say in hawaii mahalo you know have you heard this mahalo mahalo <laughs> yeah do you know that it, no it means thank you that's the uh, okay it's a pleasure language. as we say in south africa <laughs> <laughs> yeah you guys have all been so nice you know the faculty that i reached out to i was like really thinking nobody's going to email me back and it's really been encouraging and inspiring so. i think there was just a lot of synergy between our interests so um yeah and i yeah. think especially with you and you know i would i would really love to do i've never gotten to teach literary journalism in the states mm. and mm. i would love to teach a course on that or a great course or collaborate <laughs> with you on it or or guest lecture in it because that's yeah. really kind of my love as you can see so. yeah so thank you so much Okay, Julian. All the help. And chat we, soon. We'll be in touch in email. Okay. Say hi take to your care. dog and and. Family. I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.